Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone who is participating in this, our uh, 12th uh, or 11th, I'm losing track, of the webinar series on financing metropolitan governments, uh, a joint collaboration with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Uh, today's uh, webinar is of particular importance. Uh, it is about uh, capital finance. It is a way that cities get financed on a metropolitan scale. Um, and the presentation will take us on an, uh, a survey of empirical, with empirical evidence of uh, the importance of infrastructure financing and what it takes to build uh, metropolitan cities. Uh, our presenter is Mr. Shi Liu. Uh, He's a senior research fellow and China program director uh, with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and director of the Peking University Lincoln Institute Center for Urban Development and Land Policy. He is transmitting live from Beijing very late at night and we're very grateful to him. Uh, prior to his assignment in the Lincoln Institute, Mr. Liu was lead infrastructure specialist at the World Bank where he worked for 18 years. And I was very happy to have been a colleague of Xi Liu and work with him uh, uh, in some initiatives in Beijing. Uh, from 1993 to 94, he was a research associate with the Harvard Institute for International Development. And from 1985 to 87, he taught city and regional planning at Nanjing University. He has authored and co-authored a number of academic papers uh, and World Bank reports on topics of metropolitan infrastructure financing, low carbon city development, sustainable urban transport, motorization, and poverty and transport. He holds a bachelor from Sun Yat-sen University, a, ma a master's from Nanjing University, and a PhD from, from Harvard University. As I mentioned, the session today will, as all the sessions, uh, is based on the publication from Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, Financing Metropolitan Governments in Developing Countries. This chapter uh, is based on a study uh, by Greg Ingram, Shi Liu, and Karen Brandt. Um, and it deals with metropolitan infrastructure and capital finance. The study attempts to answer two main questions. How much urban infrastructure investment is needed to maintain urban economic growth? And how cities mobilize financial resources for infrastructure capital investments? Two critical questions for economic, social, and economic development. Uh, through an empirical analysis of cross-country data, the study develops estimates of the likely magnitude of national infrastructure investments in coming years, from which one could estimate the likely magnitudes of infrastructure investments for metropolitan and or urban areas. The study found that uh, the performance of infrastructure stocks in terms of delivering services efficiently varies widely across countries and across subsectors within a country, and therefore increasing the efficiency of the existing investments in infrastructure can be an important alternative strategy that is less costly than adding more capacity through capital investment, thus the importance of maintaining infrastructure. Over the last two decades, private participation in infrastructure has in, uh, increasingly played a significant role in infrastructure investments across the developing world. And today, the size of PPI is much larger than that in the development assistance. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Shi Liu and uh, Welcome him to this uh, webinar, and the floor is Thank you, Victor, for your uh, introduction. Um, I would also like to say hello to all the participants. And I could see the, the names uh, from my screen, and I can tell some of uh, my friends. So, Good morning or good evening. I actually have a few colleagues uh, sitting in the Beijing office here. Now let me uh, get started uh, with this uh, brief presentation. And I need to find out how to get this. Uh, this is my first time to do the webinar. So there is some risk because I'm still learning how to uh, work on this. And now, OK, I think I uh, finally get to my uh, PPT. Um, Victor, uh, in his uh, introduction uh, of this webinar uh, lecture, 
he uh, had told us uh, about the background of this PPT uh, from a paper written by uh, Gregory Ingram, uh, Karen uh, the Brandt, and myself. And I would uh, start by uh, telling, uh, telling you uh, what this paper is about. And this paper, we uh, analyze the effect of urbanization on infrastructure stocks. And then we uh, try to uh, project the infrastructure investment, the level of investment needed to maintain a health economic growth. We also examine the infrastructure service delivery and the quality of infrastructure performance. And then we move to uh, uh, see the changing international sources of uh, investment fund. And we also uh, analyze the, the new domestic financing instrument. By looking at uh, these several aspects, and we summarize the paper uh, uh, by indicating the way uh, forward. Um, Victor also uh, introduced by saying that the paper addressed two uh, main questions. And the first question is how much investment in infrastructure uh, would be needed to maintain a certain economic growth uh, for urban areas. And the second question uh, is uh, what are the sources of financing? Now when we get start to work on the first uh, question, and we face a constraint uh, on the data. And we know uh, reliable data on infrastructure are quite available at the national level, but not uh, at the metropolitan level. And we use the World Development Indicator as the primary source of um, information. So what we get uh, are 83 country uh, data set uh, which include the 30 low income country, 22 lower middle income country, and 21 upper middle uh, income country, and 10 high income countries. And we purposely exclude country with uh, land area smaller than 3,000 uh, 3, square uh, kilometers. So this is our data set. And the infrastructure data we have from the World Development Indicator uh, is the data in physical uh, unit. For example, in the power sector, and we have the uh, kilowatt uh, for the generating capacity. And for paved road, we have a kilometers or so. And now with the uh, national data, we try to figure out uh, how the national infrastructure stock data are correlated with the level of urbanization. And this is a methodological uh, uh, solution to deal with the lack of um, uh, data from the urban uh, level. So basically, we use an economic uh, model to devise a mechanism to project the metropolitan infrastructure need. So that's the uh, key part of the empirical study uh, done uh, for this paper. Now I'm showing you in the next uh, few slides uh, the result that we have from the empirical study using the uh, 83 cross-country uh, data set. And here you could see the elasticity uh, of urbanization associated with the, and, uh, the, the, with the infrastructure subsector stock. Now uh, the pattern shows Infrastructure stock vary uh, very little with urban population percent. So in our regression, the dependent variable uh, is the um, uh, infrastructure stock. Uh, for example, for the power sector, we have electricity generation in kilowatt. And the independent variable uh, include the per capita income and the share of uh, population, urban population in uh, the total population, and a few other control variables. In all our regression for the infrastructure subsectors, we find the um, uh, coefficient uh, for the percentage of urban population 
uh, is very, very small. It's almost zero. And they uh, basically, the regression show uh, urban population has very little to do with the national level infrastructure stock. So this finding actually gives us a very strong foundation uh, that we could actually use the national uh, uh, level infrastructure stock to project the an, uh, urban infrastructure stock by basically uh, adjusting the uh, level of a population living in urban areas. Now also in our regression, uh, we found the income elasticity of um, uh, infrastructure stock uh, vary uh, across infrastructure subsector. And from this table, um, we could see that the um, income elasticity for electric generation is 1.31, which means that when income increased by 1%, we would expect the electric generation capacity increase by 1.31%. Uh, the same uh, the, the, uh, is for, let's say, paved road. And the elasticity is 0 0.92, which means when a country's per capita income increase by 1%, uh, we would expect the, the kilometer of a paved road increase by 0.92 percent. So that's the uh, income elasticity. And they are different by subsectors. Now with this uh, the income elasticity by subsectors, and we could uh, look at the sectoral mix of infrastructure stock value. And they, are, uh, they vary with country income. Because the elasticities are different uh, when income grow and the subsector stock would grow at a different rate. So this diagram actually show the sectoral mix of infrastructure stock, uh, stock value uh, by the level of income. Yeah, something uh, coming up in the email. Let me just uh, stop this. OK, let me uh, continue. And here we could see uh, some pattern. Electric uh, generation uh, stock value uh, increase uh, with income. We can see the share of infrastructure stock value uh, for electricity uh, is high for high income country because uh, high-income country people consume more electricity, and that requires more infrastructure uh, capacity uh, for electricity. And we could also see the paved road. The proportion seem to uh, uh, hold uh, for country uh, of low income, and also country of lower middle income, and and upper middle income and even high income. And mobile subscription and phone lines, and these, are, uh, these occupy a larger share uh, for the lower income country, and, but it becomes smaller uh, for the high income country. So this is the kind of uh, sectoral mix uh, that we could see uh, by using the uh, cross country uh, data. Now with the regression, uh, uh, which we have for the infrastructure stock and uh, per capita income, we could also uh, uh, calculate the new investment uh, needed for a certain level of uh, uh, per capita income. And this uh, PowerPoint uh, slide uh, shows the, uh, the mix of uh, infrastructure stock value uh, for the, uh, the new investment a mix uh, for the infrastructure uh, stock value. And we could see uh, the, the blue part at the bottom, and this is the electric uh, generation. And for low income country, and the electric generation uh, investment uh, occupies some 30% uh, 
of the total uh, infrastructure investment each year. But in high income country, and this proportion uh, exceeds uh, 50%. And so that's uh, the, the, how this uh, figure show the pattern of uh, uh, new investment uh, by uh, the level of income. This uh, looks like this slide and the table is a little bit jammed together. We have a little bit uh, problem here. But let me try to uh, go over this slide and perhaps you... Hmm? Okay, yeah, maybe I can overcome with this. Okay. Sorry for the uh, slide, uh, which somehow turned bad. And now I show this slide uh, through the camera. Hope you can see the uh, data better. And this new slide shows the investment projections to maintain the relationship between physical stocks and economic activity. And this data all come from the regression we have and the regressions that I explained earlier. And we divide the country income group into four groups. And we also uh, sum up the um, uh, uh, total GB, uh, GDP uh, for each group. And we calculate the uh, new investment requirement. And we also calculate the requirement for maintenance. Now, we also made an assumption uh, for the economic growth rate of a, a different uh, group of country. We assume 5% growth rate for the low income uh, country, lower and middle income country, and the upper middle income country. But we assume 3% economic growth rate for uh, high income countries. So in this table, we could see uh, for the low income country, in order to maintain 5% economic growth rate, and the investment for infrastructure uh, would need to be at 2.8% of the national income. And the maintenance expenditure need to be maintained at 1.7% of the national income. So the total annual expenditure for infrastructure, uh, both investment and maintenance, uh, would be 4.5% uh, of the uh, national income. Now, uh, we, if we look at this table a bit more carefully, we could see the total infrastructure expenditure uh, increase uh, as a percentage of the national income, increase from 4.5% uh, to 5.9% if a country move from low income country to a low middle income country. And then the total expenditure would decline if the country continue to move to the upper middle income country uh, level. And then uh, the, the share of national income and, uh, will also uh, decline to 1.7 uh, when the country's uh, uh, income level reach the uh, high income level. Um, so this went through uh, this slide which shows the investment projections to maintain the relation between physical stock and economic activity. And now let's turn to the uh, next slide. And this slide is basically a projection of uh, infrastructure investment for developing country using the data uh, that we show uh, in the previous slide. And now we uh, project uh, that uh, each year a developing country would uh, require 750 billion US dollar uh, infrastructure expenditure, which uh, infrastructure investment and, and, and is uh, not include uh, maintenance. And this is the and a level of um, 
And so actually, I I should uh, take my word back. And this uh, this uh, figure shows uh, that developing countries would require 750 uh, billion uh, annual expenditure for both investment and maintenance. And investment expenditure would be about 3% of the GDP, and maintenance would be about 2% of GDP. Now, uh, this figure can be compared with the uh, uh, investment source we have in, in year uh, 2011. And uh, we have a three sources of uh, infrastructure investment. And the first one is official development assistance. And the second is the World Bank uh, investment in infrastructure in developing country. And the third is uh, private participation in infrastructure. These uh, three sources uh, account for uh, 196 billion uh, US dollar investment. So this number is compared to our projection. We could see there is a huge uh, financing gap. And we would need to uh, find financial source, uh, maybe from the government revenue and other source to fill this gap. So now we turn to uh, the discussion uh, on the and uh, on the infrastructure financing. But before we uh, talk about infrastructure investment, and we need to also look at how infrastructure uh, sector perform. And we use the same cross-country uh, data set to see the correlation of uh, infrastructure subsector uh, stock and also the correlation uh, between the subsector uh, performance uh, the, within countries. This uh, slide uh, shows two figures. The first figure is the stock level uh, correlation. And we can see the stock levels are highly correlated, which means the countries invest in different uh, infrastructure subsector and more or less in a similar uh, pattern. And the second figure uh, shows the correlation uh, between the infrastructure subsector uh, performance. And we see the correlation uh, change uh, quite significantly, uh, which means that the infrastructure performance uh, could be very different uh, by infrastructure subsectors. Some subsectors could perform uh, well, while others may perform uh, very poorly. So this correlation data actually tell us that there is a fair amount of infrastructure and uh, performance inefficiency uh, in the system. Now, when the infrastructure services are not efficient, efficiently uh, provided, uh, if infrastructure services are not efficiently uh, performed, and we know there is a waste in the infrastructure capacity. So increasing the efficiency of the existing infrastructure stock uh, should be considered as a very important investment alternative. And that's fairly straightforward. If you can utilize the and the electric generation capacity well, and if there is no waste in the transmission of electricity, and you don't have to invest uh, the excessively in the capacity. So the same uh, the rational holds for other uh, infrastructure subsector. OK, now we uh, go to see the uh, infrastructure uh, finance source. And this figure uh, actually shows the uh, trend of uh, infrastructure investment uh, from PPI and from official development aid and also from the World Bank and IDA. And what we could see 
is that uh, for the 1990s and the 2000, I mean for two decades, and PPI, uh, the total size of a PPI is much bigger uh, than the an official development aid and the World Bank and IDA. And if we look at the year of 2008, and the size of a PPI uh, is uh, at uh, 160 billion US dollar, uh, while official development aid and the World Bank uh, IDA level of infrastructure investment uh, at around uh, 20 uh, billion uh, US dollar each. And this slide uh, shows the uh, composition of PPI in infrastructure uh, subsector. And we could see uh, telecom is a big item uh, in the PPI, uh, the, the, in the private participation in infrastructure. And energy is another big item, and transport uh, also uh, look quite significant. And water and sanitation uh, is a, a very small um, a fraction of the, the PPI. And we also turn to look at the uh, PPI uh, across the four uh, subsector and six. Uh, developing country regions. So we have Latin America and the Caribbean and EAP and ECA and South uh, Asian and sub saharan Africa and MANA. Now we have uh, two panels here and the first panel is 1990 to 2000 and the second panel is 2001 to 2008. And the bar actually shows the percentage and by reason so if we look at uh, the first panel, 1990 to 2000, and the energy section, all the bars sum up together is 100. So if we compare the red panel and the blue uh, the panel, we can see uh, PPI was quite reasonably concentrated uh, in the 1990s. It's concentrated mainly in the NAC region, and the EAP region. But then uh, the next uh, decade, and the pattern changed quite a bit, and PPI is becoming uh, less reasonably uh, concentrated. In other words, uh, PPI uh, spread to uh, other regions outside EAP and NAC. But we uh, still know that uh, PPI uh, is not uh, an easy thing to do in developing countries. Uh, impediments to PPI uh, still remain. There are several reasons. And the first one is that uh, many countries still do not have a very clear PPI policy and program. And the second impediment is the weak government institutional capacity. And because the PPI is a fairly sophisticated process, and not every government has the kind of uh, capacity uh, to handle uh, PPI. And the third impediment is the presence of various legal constraints. For example, some country may have the law that prohibit the government and uh, deal with the private sector uh, to be subject to arbitration by a third country. I mean, things like that uh, would be an impediment uh, to any uh, PPI uh, deals. And the fourth impediment is the lack of a bankable project and the poor business climate. And this is especially true in the lowest income countries. Finally, decentralization of revenue and investment responsibility in some country also become an, uh, a barrier for PPI. Uh, when the local uh, government is uh, very small, uh, sometimes you just don't uh, get the kind of project and, and uh, that's uh, have the economy of scale and the bankability. And on the other hand, uh, the government may not have a sufficient uh, revenue and investment to carry on with the, the PPI. 
And we also look at uh, PPI uh, in Sub-Sahara Africa because uh, this region uh, is traditionally dependent uh, very much on official uh, development aid and the, uh, the World Bank and African Development Bank uh, for infrastructure investment. But if we compare uh, the uh, ODA, the Official Development A, uh, with a PPI, and we actually see uh, the size of the PPI in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is bigger uh, than the ODA. So uh, that's actually a very good trend, and that indicates the PPI is increasingly accepted in, in uh, many developing countries, including Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, um, we, we understand uh, urbanization is a global phenomenon. Uh, when cities grow uh, fast, and the city would require uh, more investment in infrastructure. So we look around the world, developing world, and we find out that cities uh, actually use a mix of uh, financing instruments. Uh, to meet the need for infrastructure investment. And that includes property tax revenue, and then the base financing, then the value capture, and municipal bond, and even carbon credit. And so these are the, uh, the major financing instruments uh, for uh, infrastructure. And property tax uh, in developing country uh, has a significant role, but it's not, uh, its potential uh, is uh, not yet uh, fully realized. And this uh, slide uh, shows a uh, developing country, uh, the property tax revenue uh, is uh, a very small percent of the GDP uh, comparing to OECD country and developing countries, uh, the, uh, the percentage of property tax revenue uh, over GDP is uh, 0.6, um, let me see the, uh, it's only 0.6% of the GDP. Uh, while OECD countries, uh, property tax revenue uh, is 2.12% of the GDP. So there is a still potential uh, for developing country uh, to improve the uh, uh, property taxation uh, to come up with uh, local finance for uh, infrastructure. Now we know uh, some other instruments for uh, infrastructure investment, and the well-known one is uh, Batman Levis uh, in Bogota, and in Hong Kong uh, there is a successful experience in bundling transit, uh, that's a subway, urban rail, uh, to bundle the urban rail investment with a real estate uh, development. So the model of the transit and housing co-development uh, is also uh, one way to um, and use the land value capture uh, to finance uh, both tra uh, public transport and also uh, real estate property. And in India and Mumbai, and there is a successful case uh, to use a carbon credit to finance a landfill uh, project. So, we in developing countries, uh, many cities are finding way to finance uh, infrastructure in order to maintain a certain level of economic growth. But the infrastructure financing gap, uh, as we see from the earliest slide, is quite a big. And we need to find a strategy uh, to fill the infrastructure financing gap. And our paper uh, basically concludes that there are a few ways uh, to uh, fill the infrastructure financing gap. And the first is to increase existing stock performance. And the second is better define the city's investment uh, responsibility 
so that the cities can be better focused on the needed investment uh, for infrastructure. And the third uh, suggestion is to reduce the subsidy and set the efficient service uh, tariff. And we, I did not get into the details on this discussion, um, but uh, as you could imagine, uh, subsidy and also the distortion in tariff would affect uh, the infrastructure uh, service performance. So getting the price right is very important to improve the infrastructure uh, performance. So that's related to our earlier discussion on the um, uh, performance, uh, uh, performance and inefficiency uh, of infrastructure subsector. The first recommendation is to uh, uh, promote the PPI uh, investment uh, in developing country and remove the PPI impediment. And the next one is uh, uh, to develop a domestic, uh, domestic financing in, uh, instrument, uh, such as the municipal uh, bond, and also some an, uh, land-based uh, the, the financing uh, mechanism. Uh, finally, uh, we think it's very important uh, to maintain a certain level of investment in infrastructure in order to uh, uh, keep in line uh, with the uh, urban economic uh, growth. So that's uh, the presentation. Uh, it's brief, um, but I hope uh, and I deliver the key points. And now let's uh, get to the uh, next uh, the stage, and that's the questions and, and, and answer. Thank you very much, Julie. That was an excellent presentation. Incredibly important issues raised uh, for this series that we've had more than 11 hours of webinars, and this is a key part of the puzzle that we're trying to put together. We invite everyone to uh, vote. Uh, the question is, for the last two decades, how has the size of private sector investment in infrastructure compared to the size of development assistance in infrastructure in developing countries? Uh, it's not a trick question. <laughs> it is indeed uh, a, quite an absolute answer. And Let's freeze it because it's already there. Uh, so I think I think the message is clearly well, it's clearly there. Shiliu. they understand that development assistance is quite small relative to the to the other. Um, next question: uh, How was the size of private sector investment in infrastructure compared? So this is how was the size of infrastructure investment in infrastructure compared with the size of development assistance? in sub-Saharan Africa during the decade of the 2000s. So this is a regional, uh, regional uh, differences. And the answers are coming in now from our participants. And we've had a growth in our number of participants over the last uh, 20 minutes. So we're very happy to have everyone have to, that has joined. Uh, so let's, uh, it's equalizing here, but let's freeze it now because we are running out of time. Any, any comments, Shiliu, from this response? Uh, well, the right answer is C, um, but I think uh, and, uh, some people choose uh, and, uh, the answer B is not too far from the uh, correct answer and the data we have. Thank you. Let's go to the third question now. And what would be the likely size of annual expenditures for infrastructure investment and maintenance in developing countries? So what if you if, if one was to ask you what is the ballpark on how much is needed for infrastructure, what is the, the right answer? Okay, let's, let's, let's freeze it now. Uh, about six. Uh. Okay. So, Shilio, any any comments on that? Uh, well, this one and the based on our calculation, and the answer is B. But of course, I mean our calculation uh, rely on some empirical data and also some uh, assumption. 
and I see uh, some participants choose uh, uh, answer C, and I think that uh, the, the number, uh, uh, I would not say that's incorrect, but I would say that's a more optimistic um, uh, prediction. Thank you very much, Xiliu. I think very illustrative to the dialogue that, that we're about to have. Uh, mm -hmm. We have gotten some questions, and we invite others to please send in your questions and comments and reflections. Um, there is a question uh, from uh, Tommaso Giovancini. Uh, how does PPI ratio over total investment relates with infrastructure performance? That is to say, uh, are PPI investments more efficient than, than public investments? Uh, that's from Tommaso Giovancini. Mm -hmm. um, from uh, Navaid Kwerji, uh, did you also look at PPI data post the global economic meltdown in 2008? How these trends changed in the last five years? And I think we showed you showed it clearly in your table, and you can maybe describe it a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Those two, uh, Liu and, and we can go on to the others. Okay. And uh, uh, first question. Uh, yeah, and the. The question is not the one uh, we analyze in the paper, but there uh, is a vast host of empirical literatures, and that compare the performance of a PPI uh, project uh, with the performance of um, a government uh, funded public uh, project. And I think the empirical evidence show the PPI a projects are generally uh, uh, performing uh, better than the, uh, the public uh, the investment project. And that's my uh, understanding from reading the uh, empirical literature. And for the second question uh, by uh, Lave uh, Kurashi, my friend, um, well, I think uh, our, our data uh, for PPI uh, is up to year 2008. So that's the year when the uh, global uh, uh, financial crisis uh, happened. And my sense is that, I mean, if we look at the, uh, that slide again, uh, we could see uh, PPI investment uh, increase uh, steadily uh, before the crisis, uh, financial crisis of uh, 1997. And then PPI dropped, and after a while, PPI uh, uh, regained the momentum until year 2008. And um, we did not show uh, the uh, PPI uh, number uh, for the last few years. Um, I believe I have seen some data actually it, uh, PPI uh, has uh, uh, regaining momentum uh, in the last uh, the, uh, two or three years uh, in some countries, and I, I haven't seen the data for uh, for the whole world, and but I have seen some data uh, uh, that show uh, encouraging uh, uh, momentum for the last uh, two to three years. Thank you very much, Shiliu. Uh, uh, a question from uh, Jean-Baptiste Rasafimian. Uh, without clear legal and institutional framework on public-private partnership, how can the government of poor, poor countries encourage the participation of the private sector? It's a basic question. Yeah. An important one. Um, I think for the, uh, the, the low-income country, or the lowest-income country, the major barrier is the lack of a bankable project. The demand may not be uh, sufficient enough uh, for the uh, economic viability of the project uh, for the standalone uh, private sector participation, and it may be possible with the uh, government and uh, financing as a part of the, uh, the fi government finance of uh, a part of the uh, infrastructure investment. But of course, I mean, without a, uh, the legal framework, it would be very difficult uh, to do PPI. Uh, but some country uh, take some good opportunity uh, to implement uh, one or two PPI. 
and to learn and understand how to uh, uh, manage PPI. And after one or two pilot projects, and they, they uh, start to look into the uh, regulation and even the law. I think that uh, there are some and uh, such cases. And um, but in general, I mean, because the international experience about PPI uh, is now plenty, so uh, I would suggest. Uh, the countries to look into the uh, legal and regulatory framework and strengthen the legal and regulatory framework to some extent uh, so that the private sector would feel comfortable to come in. Getting away a little bit from the PPI to the more basic questions that I think that are fundamental and I'm trying to put it into context at the national and at the metropolitan level. Uh, mm -hmm. A question from uh, Shahina Nisar, is there a program of monitoring the in indicators, uh, uh, infrastructure needs in indicative countries, and I would add metropolitan areas. So the whole issue of uh, indicators and monitoring infrastructure needs at the, at the country and city level. What are the, what's the state of the art on that? Uh, well, I have seen some countries uh, that uh, come up with the statistics of the infrastructure uh, the, uh, service level uh, by subsector. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the Chinese uh, the, the, the statistical yearbook, and you can actually find uh, an, uh, the, the, the percentage of a population, uh, urban population connected with uh, clean uh, water and sanitation, and also the number of uh, the phone line connected, and how many um, uh, mobile phone subscriptions or so. And, and these are the good indicators to, to show uh, the accessibility and also the usage of infrastructure service in cities. I'm sure uh, there are uh, many other countries that have these kind of statistics. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, there, there are, I think in Brazil, in Mexico, the National Institute of Geography and Statistics has very good information at, at the city level. Uh, I think I'd like to ask a question based on a very good presentation we had yesterday. Today, we ha I see that uh, uh, Yuan Xiao is online. She's participating. Uh, she's a doctoral candidate finishing at MIT. Uh, in July, and she made a presentation on, on, on the whole issue of urban expansion in China, which I think um, uh, the, the issue of spatial sprawl uh, with infrastructure needs. Uh, you know, the, the, the more metropolitan areas sprawl, the greater their needs. So there's a, there's a direct correlation. I think if you could talk a little bit about the, the issue of the efficiency of infrastructure investment with respect to the spatial efficiency on the growth of cities. To me, that would be a, a key consideration. Any, any reflection on that? Uh, yes, I think uh, the bank uh, recently published something on an, uh, the transit-oriented development, uh, which also shows the um, uh, development density and the viability of uh, public transportation. And I think that this uh, the, 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 the analysis is uh, very relevant uh, to our understanding of the relationship uh, between urban sprawl and infrastructure. And we all know when a city is developed in a, uh, the big, uh, in a big sprawling uh, way, and the city would need a lot of uh, infrastructure investment, and the density of a usage would not be high enough and so there will be um, a uh, problem of uh, cost recovery. And so to develop uh, the compact city, and you may not need uh, so much investment for infrastructure in transportation, and you can also gain in a high level of ridership uh, for the public transportation, which will contribute to a healthy cost recovery. So there are a lot of uh, the good things about the compact uh, city development. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think that those are key messages uh, uh, from your presentation, especially on the, on the, on the slide that you had, um, the fact that it, it makes sense to maintain infrastructure uh, rather than necessarily expand 
the, the, the payoff on, on maintenance is higher than the payoff on expansion. That's a message that we all know about, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, it's less, it's less uh, exciting to cut the ribbon from a maintenance perspective than to a new project, and I think that, that we have a bias towards that. And then the issue of land use and, and infrastructure. Uh, I was looking through some old publications. There's some 1970s book uh, published on, on energy and land efficiency. I mean, this is a topic that we know about, we've known about, but we have neglected. And I think it's no longer, we don't have the luxury anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a question from Badish Patel. Um, what are the key project evaluation criteria that are looked on by the private sector while investing in countries in transition? So what would be the criteria from the private sector for PPIs? in this country? Uh, uh, I think the key thing uh, for private sector is uh, and, uh, on the uh, rate of return for investment uh, in any country and because uh, the capital is internationally available and the private sector come up uh, with the capital to invest in a particular project that used to be in the uh, public investment uh, the, the domain and but when the private sector come in and they want to uh, do business and so uh, uh, they would look into the um, uh, rate of return and of course they would also uh, uh, look at some other uh, uh, the things and uh, one project and uh, an infrastructure project is a big investment and the private sector will also uh, try to understand in uh, the, the different uh, dimension of the project and then uh, the, that would help them to think about the risk management and uh, associated with the project, things like the social aspect, uh, environmental aspect or so. But I would say the return is the most important criteria. Uh, should you, I guess, uh, based on your response, the, the, the tension that exists between the, the private rate of return of, of capital with mm -hmm. um, with respect to the public interest of government in infrastructure, including having a life cycle cost type of accounting with respect to investments. Mm -hmm. So the public sector has a different bottom line on infrastructure than the private sector. How do you reconcile that? Or is there a niche infrastructure that the private sector is better placed to work in and a niche infrastructure where the government is better placed to work with? Or is it a matter of of getting subsidies right so that we have uh, uh, infrastructure produced in the right quantity, amount, and type to reflect the interest of the public sector? Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, actually a very good question. I believe uh, uh, some uh, the 10 to 15 years ago, the bank actually uh, discussed this uh, the question before. And one uh, key thing about public investment is that um, in our uh, traditional cost-benefit analysis, and we never uh, look into the cost of a public fund, because when the government come up with uh, the, the and, uh, finance, and the, much of the money come from the taxation uh, revenue, and the government will need to uh, uh, run the taxation agencies, uh, collect the tax, uh, collect the taxes, and this would uh, cost as well. But when we uh, analyze the public investment, we never include the uh, cost of a public fund. But when we uh, look at the private uh, sector investment, of course, the, the private sector uh, will consider uh, every item of cost. And today, it's very hard to compare uh, the return for uh, public finance investment and the private finance investment, uh, mainly because uh, there is um, a gap in the understanding of the cost of public fund. Thank you very much. And I think the whole issue of the, of the life cost accounting, accounting for the, all the externalities involved in the in, in the infrastructure as well, and the, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's a huge a huge issue. Let's get one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap up. It's been a very good discussion. Uh, Sundan Tiwari, um, I guess it's related to what we were discussing. How open is the private sector uh, to including climate adaptation costs in infrastructure projects? So internalizing these costs into the project, or is that 
not in their concern, their realm. Well, um, I appreciate that question, but I'm sorry I don't have an answer for this uh, because um, and uh, the, uh, certainly I think the private sector would pay attention to climate adaptation, but how open they are, and that's something I have never and, uh, thought about and have never and, uh, asked. And so I'm sorry that I don't have an answer for this question. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, this week in Washington, we had an environmental film festival that was incredibly good. I think it's still ongoing. I went to um, uh, a film uh, at the Carnegie Institute of Science, and it was called uh, Sand Wars. And he talked about sand, uh, the basic building block of cities. And they even talked about how sand is priced uh, or not priced correctly. Apparently, there's only in Denmark, it's priced accurately to reflect externalities associated with just extraction of sand. So even as basic an input as sand is not priced right, uh, capital is even priced for, with further distortions than just the basic elements of building cities. So thank you very much for your presentation, Shil. You will have the, uh, edit, the, the PPT available in 24 hours. We'll have the video. We're going to also take out the little snippet that where we had the audio problem. We apologize for that. And uh, an advertisement uh, before uh, allowing you your final words. You mentioned the property tax and how important it is. On April 1st, we have the chapter on property tax and metropolitan areas being presented by William Mikulski. Uh, so if you're interested in property tax, uh, April 1st at 10 a.m. Washington time is the place where you can be to um, get information and insight. Uh, any final words from you, uh, Xiliu, in Beijing? Uh, well, I certainly enjoy this uh, webinar section and also notice that we have uh, 22 uh, participants. As I say from the beginning, and this is my first time to do the webinar, I'm still learning how to do it uh, right and do it efficiently. So here I would like to thank the participants for their patience. Thank you very much, Julie. You did a great job. Thank you and thank the participants. We're going to go on to a uh, Shil, you please stay online yeah, for here. some other business we'll take care of later. And uh, so thank you for every, to everyone. Please fill out the survey, and we appreciate your participation. See you April 1st.